I don't even know about my boundaries. I don't know if they're good. I don't know if they're bad. I don't know if they're too strict. I don't know if they're too loose. So part of it is you have to think about um, where are you resentful? Because if you put everyone above yourself, if you are last on your own list, if you have a terribly negative inner voice that's so mean and caustic to you, then you are literally setting the bar in your life. You will inevitably attract others who agree with that low self-assessment. And when you feel good about yourself, live self-love, you are setting the bar higher and you will inevitably attract folks who think that that is how worthy you are. Welcome, Terry Cole, to Women of Impact. You are the boundary <laughs> boss. And I want to say um, thank you so much for joining because today I want to dig deep into boundaries because I feel like for us women especially to have the life we want to really go after that dream to not feel like we're getting pushed around and told what we should and shouldn't do it all comes back down to boundaries and your book Boundary Boss really is so um, amazing at laying out all the steps in order for us to show up to be the person we want to be and set the boundaries so welcome to Women of Impact. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so psyched to be here. Oh, my God, me too. So where I want to start is something very unique that I've never heard about. You talk about um, corrupt boundary data. <laughs> Can you actually just, um, tell us what that is? And then we'll dive a little deeper. Sure. This is really the, the misinformation that we got growing up about boundaries. So nobody talks to you about boundaries, you witness them. So all of us have this downloaded boundary blueprint is what I call it. So this unconscious material that drives our behavior in reference to boundaries. So it matters what country, what culture, your family system, all of those things, the modeled behavior that you saw growing up, all of them come together to create your boundary blueprint. But most people a, don't know that there's a lot of corrupted data in that blueprint, and B, they don't even know that these um, downloaded schemas kind of in your mind, your unconscious mind, if you go down into the basement, you could actually take a look at them and decide whether that is for you or not for you. But usually we just go, oh, I guess this is the way the world is. So hopefully what Boundary Boss is doing is giving people a step-by-step -step process to find out what is in your basement around boundaries. I love that. What is in your basement? That's so good. Because um, going to the beginning of just assessing our assumptions, because I think that that's something that we just almost take for granted. How do we start to assess what type of um, mindset and limiting beliefs we actually have in order to then say, oh, I can then change this, or this is a choice. Most people will ask me, I don't even know about my boundaries. I don't know if they're good. I don't know if they're bad. I don't know if they're too strict. I don't know if they're too loose. So part of it is you have to think about um, where are you resentful, right? I have people do a resentment inventory because this will usually reveal where a boundary is needed or one that you've set is being violated or a need of yours is not being met. And instead of just being like, I'm angry, we really are drilling down into who are you holding resentment for? Because that usually can tell you where you need a boundary. And in reference to figuring out your boundary sort of archetype or your style, I actually created a free quiz that people can take. It's just boundaryquiz.com where you can go and see where, where do you fall? Are your boundaries, your disordered boundaries, are they because they're too loose? Or is it because they're too rigid? And this is something that I think that there is um, a, a lot of myths around. People are like, oh, you're a boundary boss. You must be saying no all the time and telling people my way or the highway. And I'm like, oh, no, <laughs> <laughs> that's not it at all. <laughs> that is the other side of the spectrum. So in particular, women have a tendency to overgive. I mean, let's be honest about how we were raised. Most of us were raised and praised for being self-abandoning codependents. Can you break that down a little? Like when you say that, what would you mean by that? 
Well, I mean, self-abandoning means that I choose what I think is better for you than for me. I don't want conflict. I don't want you to be mad at me. I'm afraid to be rejected. So instead of asserting what is true for me, I will abandon myself in that moment. I will suck it up, take one for the team. I could, you know, there's a million things we could say about it, but that is self-abandonment. When we prioritize the needs and desires of others over our own, right? So that's the self-abandoning part, but the codependent piece is so incredibly common with women, because we are taught to be like, we're the bridgers, right? We're the like producers of like life, right? We're we're the ones in the middle of all the things. But when you think about what codependency actually is, well, usually it's overgiving, right? It's, It's really a covert or overt bid for control. That is what codependency is. And it doesn't look like that. And I have this very high functioning group of women in my practice. I've always had that demographic. So when I first started seeing this, this sort of epidemic of codependency and disordered boundaries, and I would say, oh, hey, what you're describing is codependent behavior. And they would be like, what are you, nuts? I'm, I am not dependent on squat. Everyone is dependent on me. I'm making all the money. I'm the one doing all the frigging things and making sure the kids are getting where they need to go. And I'm like, oh, my clients do not know what codependency actually is. And so I created a new name, high functioning codependency, because that is what I was when I was still super actively codependent. So high functioning codependents are the women where everyone is like, you're the rock, right? I always come to you with my problems and we're doing it all, but at the expense of ourselves. Inherent in codependency are disordered boundaries. So you cannot be codependent and have healthy boundaries because these two things are actually mutually exclusive. But what is codependency? It's you being overly invested in the feeling states, the outcomes, the circumstances, the relationships of the people in your life to the detriment of your internal peace, your financial or physical, spiritual well-being. Because really, Lisa, I mean, all of us are lovers, right? Of course, we are invested in the happiness of the people that we love, that's not codependency. Codependency is when you are overly so. And if you're wondering, anyone watching or listening, like, how can I tell? Well, if your best friend calls you with a problem, I'm going to ask you to check your urgency. Did you suddenly start making phone calls and Googling and going, getting your books and underlining things? Like, do you feel compelled to fix your friend's problem. The moment your best friend called you, did that then become literally your problem? That is codependency, where instead of being compassionate to our friend or having faith that our friend has the answers for herself, we really think it's on us. And really it's so much of this stems from childhood, a chaotic childhood, addiction, abuse, and really even just a very strict Household, religious household, pretty much any household anyone was raised in could, you know, could really sow the seeds for codependency. Oh my God, that was so amazing. Like that was so amazing because I've heard, you know, codependency, the word thrown around a lot. And so you just breaking that down was so beautiful. And I'd never heard it explained like that before. So many of us are feeling stuck right now. We have this dream and desire that we have ignored or put on pause for so long. And we tell ourselves that we'll go after it when, when I have the time, when I have the confidence. And trust me, I get it. I spent eight years waiting for my life to change because I didn't have the confidence to do it myself. But what if I didn't need the confidence to make a change? What if I could have radical confidence, which means not having the confidence, but doing it anyway? These are some of the 10 no BS life lessons I'll be teaching you in my new book, Radical Confidence. I have so many amazing bonuses, so click the link below and let's get radically confident right freaking now. How do we start to then pass between the the wonderful feeling of feeling needed, Mm -hmm. 
And now we're spilling into codependency where you have a dysfunctional relationship and you are not setting boundaries. Well, the awareness is the first step because what shifted it for me in my 20s, I had a brilliant therapist who helped me see that what I was doing, one of, there was one of my sisters had a really like rough life. So she was with an abusive guy. There was all these things where I for sure thought it was my problem to fix. And I was talking about it in therapy and crying and what am I going to do, right? <laughs> my therapist is like, um, excuse me. So she went on to say, um, you know, Terry, let me ask you something. What makes you think that you know what lessons she needs to learn in this lifetime? And I was like, well, I think we can all agree. It doesn't have to be with this abusive idiot. Like why? I mean, it doesn't have to be like this. And she was like, I actually can't agree with that because I have no idea what your sister needs to learn in this lifetime. And neither do you. Do you know what's really going on for you? And I was like, no, obviously. And she, I said, clue me in. You know? And she said, you have worked really hard to create internal peace for yourself and your sister's dumpster fire of a life is really messing with that piece. So what you really want is to tie that up in a bow so you can be internally peaceful, which you can't because you're so codependent with your sister. What's happening to her feels like it's happening to you, but it's not. And I was like, oh my God. And when I really thought about it, because prior to that, I was like, you know me, I'm just a lover. I really like to think of myself as Mother Teresa. Right. Right. Like it's all from this loving place that there was so much clarity in that moment that it was really a bid for control because her messed up life was messing up my peace. And she said, now, from that perspective, now, how do we problem solve? And I was like, I step back until she wants help or we'll get away from this idiot and that'll help her. She's like, correct. I step back. I tell my sister, hey, I love you, but I can't listen to you telling me the same horrendous crap every day about this guy. But if you ever want to make a change, I'm still your person. And about nine months later, she called me and she's like, hello, I'm ready. I was like, great, I'm getting in my car. And that was that. And she went back to school and got sober. And all of the things that came from that were not because of me, because I centered myself in my sister's problem. They were because my sister was ready to change and to grow and to commit to a different life. And when you think about how narcissistic it really is or self-important to be like, but I really know what you should do. Of course, that wasn't how I meant it. I didn't think I had a choice. I thought I had to do it because she was my sister. But this is what codependency looks like and the truth about what we're doing. That bid for control really is hard. So what can you do instead, right? That was the longest way around the barn to get back to your question, which is what can we do instead? Part of it is your awareness, right? I, I build all of my work on these five pillars of self-mastery or transformation that I created. And the first is self-awareness. So you cannot shift anything that you were unaware of, right? That's obvious. And then we move into self-knowledge. Like, why am I this way? And then there's self-acceptance, self-compassion, and then self-mastery. But this beginning phase of awareness is really important. So what does that require? It requires you to become radically curious without judgment. You know, Deepak would say, become the observer without judgment. And this is like the highest sort of of your own evolution that you get curious and go, huh, well, my friend called me with a problem. Did I immediately jump into action or was I able to stop and say to my friend, hey, before I weigh in, if you want my opinion, because if they're used to coming to you, they do want your opinion, but you don't need to give it. What do you think? What does your gut say? Listen, you, you know better than anyone what's right for you. So I'm here to brainstorm it, but what is your gut? Like there's a way that we can trust that the people in our life um, are responsible for themselves, whether they know what to do or not. But it's not people that we love, right? It's like we're managing people mm -hmm. instead of relating to them in this love way. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, absolutely. And that's so beautiful um, way of framing. I'd actually love to, I'm so specific. It's like, okay, what did you say? So with your sister, for instance, mm-hmm. everything you just said is beautiful. And asking someone, what does your gut tell you? What are you feeling? I totally understand that. Um, now I'm envisioning in a scenario, which I think we all know these people where it's the same problem that repeats and they don't want to look at themselves. And yep. like you were saying with your sister, where you came to this conclusion of, oh, I'm, you know, codependent. It's not good for either of us. Mm-hmm. How did you overcome the guilt? Because I think that's so huge when it comes to boundaries that we feel guilty, that maybe we're abandoning them. Like in those moments if you have your sister who you love to bits and who maybe is very emotional and when you say I can't deal with this anymore or you know did you go through any guilt did you go through any worry of abandonment does she approach you with abandonment because then what do we say in those situations where we can have the strength to stick by the boundary that we're trying to lay out well all good questions and of course I had guilt because I had been such an overfunctioner. So to actually draw that boundary, that very difficult emotional boundary was incredibly hard, but she knew why I was doing it. And when, you know, I just said, listen, I love you and you staying in this abusive situation is too painful for me. I can't continue because it is disrupting my life so much. So If you want to change, I'm here. I love you, but I can't be a part of this because it is so dysfunctional and painful. And she's like, I love you too. And I understand now she understood. And part of her, I think was relieved in a way that I was going to back off. And then, you know, she she was in it for nine months before she came out of it. Mm -hmm. And of course I was worried, Hey, maybe she's never coming out of it. I don't know. Right. But it, it wasn't just that it was my right to not do it. It is wrong emotionally to think that we have the answers for others. Think about it this way. When I was doing all of these quick fixes for my sister, giving money, going to help, finding a place for her to live, whatever, all of those things, what I was doing is I was lessening the, the pain that would inspire her to change. You were saying you have a friend who calls and talks about the same crap, but never like ever changes and doesn't want to look at herself, just wants to keep talking. That's the same thing because you get off the phone with that friend and that friend feels lighter. She's like, wow, Lisa, I always feel so much better after talking to you. You get off the phone and you feel like someone barfed toxic waste on you because they did. So you're absorbing that energy. They feel better. So now the pain, the suffering that would inspire them to find their own solution. We are literally lessening that likelihood of them doing that if we continue to be a Band-Aid on this gaping wound that needs more than a Band-Aid, right? But it buys more time. And as soon as I knew that me doing that was really colluding with her lowest self, I was like, oh yeah, I'm done. Like, I'm not colluding with the addicted part of her anymore. I have faith. She can get it together. I really think that she can get sober if she wants to, but not if I'm here, you know, doing all the things so she doesn't feel the pain of her choices, right? These are choices. And I don't think addiction is a choice. I mean, I'm recovering myself. So it's not, it's no blame in that, but choices, right? You're choosing to stay. Wow, that was so strong. And um, where's the fine line between then obligation and um, a choice? Because I think a lot of us do feel the obligation um, and we don't realize it's a choice to then switch that. Well, part of it is question your downloaded blueprint. Question why you feel obligated. Is it because your mother made you feel obligated because you were the oldest kid and you know, you take care of your family as everything. And if you don't do this, then you're wrong. I mean, you come from a very strong culture where family is all the things being Greek. It's like Mm -hmm. every country culture and family system itself has all of these cultural norms of the right way to be. You were indoctrinated into these beliefs and maybe some of them stay and maybe a lot of them don't. 
And you have a choice to, and you know, you, you yourself, you're a good example because you are an outside the box thinker. So people are like, you don't want to have kids. And you're like, cause I don't fucking want to, like, <laughs> you're able to own like, Hey, I'm not less than because of that. But if you didn't have such a strong sense of self or hadn't done the work that you've done, that might make you feel ashamed. That might make you feel bad. Or you might have kids, even though you don't want to. Like that's how strong and how deep those, um, that, that, what do we call it? Corrupted data runs. In order to be lovable, you must um, behave this particular way, yeah. which is just simply not true. Yeah, I definitely was told that growing up that I would end up um, a wife and kid, you know, having um, kids and I never really questioned it. And so that mm-hmm. was where like the obligation, I think, came in where it's like, of course, I'm going to do it. Like, you know, my parents have been to- telling my, me my whole life right. um, until I decided that I didn't want it. And I had to question that. I had to set boundaries with my family because mm-hmm. it's, no matter how many times, and I'm sure many people can relate, no matter how many times you may actually even say something out loud, it took me time to get the courage to say it and then say it out loud. And even when I did, I still got people asking me, even when I said I've decided to not have children. I would get my family and my dad and my mom saying, you know, oh, but, you know, life isn't, you know, worth living if you don't have children. And so I ended up having to set that boundary and say, can you please stop trying to persuade me? Because it's mm-hmm. taking away almost the... Um, The power of me saying I am not going to have it because it is insinuating you can now persuade me to change my mind. Right. But this is a boundary issue. Mm -hmm. So this is really, it's an emotional and or a mental boundary issue. So you made a decision, you know how you feel, you know what you think, and you've been super clear about your boundary. And then you have, we call them repeat offenders who just keep on coming back to trample on that boundary. One more time. It's like the person who you say, absolutely not. I don't want to do the thing. I'm not doing the thing. I had a client who had this experience. And literally as she's leaving this party or wherever she was that she had to like emphatically say no many times to this person, they were like, okay, so why don't you just take tonight? Why don't you sleep on it? And we'll talk tomorrow. She's like, oh my God, (laughs) what part of no, do you not understand? And that is a boundary violation because someone is forcing, attempting to wear down your no, that's a boundary violation, change your mind. After you've said, please don't, a boundary violation there too. When you think about what we learned, right? As little girls, what, what was it? Be good, right? Be a good girl, smile, turn that frown around, right? Don't be a troublemaker. Don't stir the pot. Mm -hmm. And it's all about giving to others also, where if you're a good girl, or if you grow up to be a good woman, you know, what is, what is embodies femininity is all about self-sacrifice, all about self-sacrifice, which who wants that? You know, that that's not what it's all about, but yet it is what we learned. And so When you think about boundaries, think about them as a language. And you wouldn't feel bad if you weren't fluent in like Mandarin, just because you really wanted to be, right? You would know, oh, if I want to be fluent in Mandarin, here are things I need to do, steps I need to take, people, I need a guide. I literally need a step-by-step process. And you wouldn't expect to be fluent after doing that for like two hours, you would know it takes time. This is the same thing where we always start small with everything when it comes to boundaries is that we never tackle like the boundary bullies or the boundary destroyers in our life. It's like the low priority people where we just, if you're someone who they get your order wrong when you go out and you oh normally would say, that's fine, I'll eat it, I don't care, it doesn't matter. Just send the friggin' salad back and get the salad that you want, <laughs> right? Just, just send it back because it's about you. When you think about what, what are boundaries, these are like your own personal rules of engagement. And we share them with other people because it tells them what's okay with us and what's not okay with us. And that means you must know your preferences, your desires, your limits, and your deal breakers. Because those are the things that not only make up your boundaries, they also make up who you are. 
your preferences, desires, limits, deal breakers, Lisa, they're unique to you. Mine are unique to me. We are all so different, just like our fingerprints, right? Or our DNA. It's very similar. Most people don't know their own preferences, desires, limits, and deal breakers. People who identify as women in particular don't know because we're so busy. I can tell you what everyone else's preferences are. (laughs) Every person in my life, I know what they eat, what they're allergic to, what they do and don't like, all the things. You know, when I would have um, women come into my therapy practice and I would say, okay, like in the beginning, like, so what brings you joy? That would just be one of the questions. And they, I would say, honestly, nine times out of 10, they would say, I don't know. I gotta be honest. I never really thought about it. I'm like, okay, well, now it's time to think about it. Maybe we can think about it now because they're so busy becoming an expert on all the people in their life. But all of that overgiving, overfunctioning, overdoing, that abandonment of self, that can only lead to one place, which I hate to say it's like a one way ticket to bitter land, but it is because you will only be angry eventually. You can do it for a long time and then you're pissed. And think about all these moms. Like I have friends who are like, oh, my mom is such a martyr, blah, blah, blah. Well, you don't think that that mom, when she was 20, was like, I can't wait to grow up and be a martyr. I mean, <laughs> right? <laughs> so true. She didn't think that was going to happen. Yeah. But it does. Because if you are self-sacrificing, because it's a way to keep people attached to you, because that's what codependency really is, that is driven by fear, not actually driven by love. So if you're kind of bean counting the stuff that you do for everyone, if you feel that people are not appreciative enough of all of your efforts, you want to question, like, am I giving? Because I'm afraid if I don't, I'll be rejected. I'll be judged. I'll be kicked out of the pack. Like, what is the fear? Because if you're giving from love, you're not bean counting, right? You're giving because you want to, not because you're like, I'm keeping score now you owe me. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. I've got an amazing quote of yours. Um, giving is love. Overgiving is dysfunctional. Yeah, it is. And I think that, you know, at least part of this thing about self-love, because self-love is such a, um, an important part of what I write about in the book. Like it's less of a feeling, let's say, and it's more of a way of life that is evidenced in your relationships, your boundaries, your self-care, right? How, how well you negotiate for your own needs. That is what self-love is because it's, it's action. It isn't a feeling. It's like, how are you relating to yourself? Because if you put everyone above yourself, if you are last on your own list, if you have a terribly negative inner voice that's so mean and caustic to you, then you are literally setting the bar in your life you will inevitably attract others who agree with that low Mm self-assessment. And when you feel good about yourself, live self-love, you are setting the bar higher and you will inevitably attract folks who think that that is how worthy you are. But it all rises or falls based on how you feel about yourself. And so I would have clients who were like looking for love in all the wrong places because they were looking for self-love in love with others. And I'm like, they're not the same. And this place that we have, every single one of us has this inside of us, this place that only self-love can fill. No amount of overworking, no amount of love from others can fill this particular spot within us. So it really is a a worthy cause to get fall madly and deeply in love with yourself and question these limiting beliefs about, oh, don't get a big head. And if you fall madly and deeply in love with yourself, then you're conceited or you're selfish. That really isn't true. But if you are not rocking this kind of self-love where you're taking care of yourself first, you really don't have that much to give to others because what we're seeking from others, they cannot provide because it is a inside job, you know? 
It's so beautiful because um, I think you even said something along the lines of we think of boundaries as saying no and pushing people away, but actually it's about keeping our inner peace inside of us. And that was such a beautiful way of um, flipping the perspective of boundaries, Mm. because I do think that going back to the guilt thing that we were talking about, if we can see it as this is good for you, and this isn't about being mean or pushing people away, but this is for your future, your sanity, your happiness. Like, I just think that allows us to take a step forward if we don't necessarily feel like we have the confidence yet to set that boundary. It, it's, I think you're right. And flipping the, the meaning or flipping the, mm-hmm. the view yeah. on that, it is the most loving thing yeah. that you can ever do. Because what is it to establish healthy boundaries in your relationships? It's really about allowing the people in your life to authentically know who you are. When you're saying yes, when you really want to say no, that isn't being nice. That's just being dishonest. So how can anyone ever authentically love you if you never allow them to authentically know you? Mm. I've never thought of it like that. Oh my God, that's so amazing. That's so true. Again, going back to perspective, I'm always trying to think about what are the reasons why people don't set boundaries in the first place and what is the thing that holds us back? And everything you're saying in just flipping the way that we think about it, to me really does allow then the space to want to do it with grace versus like for me, when I was first setting boundaries, I was like, all right, you've got to have the strength. You've got to go in like a bull. You've got to have to draw the hard line. Right. And it's like, because I didn't have enough confidence to set it and keep it. So I thought if I go in with aggression, maybe I can't be bullied out of it. Um, Obviously it was terrible strategy, (laughs) Um, but it was the first thing that I needed in order to just get started. And so everything that you've just said allows, I think, people to really get started with, um, without the aggression that I came in and had originally. It's normal though, like, like what you're saying, right? We go from the pendulum always swings like that. Are they were too porous? That's what we call them boundaries that are too loose and then you swing over here and it's too rigid but through time and repetition you realize that there is a healthy place in between and I think that for people watching or listening if you're like but I don't even know where to start you do though so why don't we just start with stopping the auto yes why don't we just start with that? If you're someone who's a people pleaser, and this won't speak to everyone, but it will most likely speak to quite a, a big majority of people listening. If you're a people pleaser, or if you sort of just are an insta yes person, when someone's like, can you do this? Or would you do this? We're going to stop doing that because we need to stop doing that. So moving into um, what do you do instead, right? And you can buy time. You can literally buy time. That is what you're going to do instead. So you're just going to say, oh, hey, I just need to get back to you in this period of time or that period of time. I need to check with my partner, my roommate, whoever it is. That is what you're doing. Because if you can stop the immediate, yes, it is so much easier to come back and say no, if that's what the answer is. So when we give the immediate yes to crap, we really want to say no to, then what happens? Oh, then we find a way to get out of it. We get a migraine. Oh, sorry. I just got a migraine because I can't come, right? Like we end up being that, the person that people really can't count on because we can't deal with telling the truth. And you know what? If you say yes, when you really want to say no, no offense, but you're actually not really emotionally trustworthy. You're not a trustworthy person because I know my friends who are people pleasers. I love them. And when they say, I'm definitely going to be there, I think in my mind, there's a 50% chance she's going to do that. And the people I feel safest with are the people who, when they say they're going to do something, I'm like, oh yeah, she doesn't say yes unless she's really in. I don't have to double check. There's not going back and forth. It's just, no. I have a great story in the book about a close friend of mine, uh, Elizabeth, and I got in touch with her. I was like, hey, do you want to go to Honduras or wherever I was going for something? And she's like, oh, no, I hate it. I hate hot weather. I hate the sand. I hate sun. Nah, but thanks. I hope you have a great time. Like she wasn't even like, oh, I wonder if she's going to be upset. Like mm-hmm. she was just like, no, I don't like it. Great. It didn't make me think she doesn't like me, right? She doesn't like hot weather. That's her right. 
And she's someone I can trust because she's not a bullshitter. So you actually mentioned the types of boundaries. I'd love to go through the categories and the types because um, I think that would be super useful for people to, once you've said, identify and Mm -hmm. now start to pass out what type of boundary they then need to put into place. Right. So we have categories. So there's categories of boundaries and then sort of styles of boundaries. So the categories are we start with physical boundaries, which is all about your physicality, who can touch you, how, um, how much personal space you need. So think about a close talker when you have someone who's like, you, you step back and they step forward and you're like, hey, man, you eventually will say something. But some people don't mind a close talker. Right. So it's again, it's all very um, unique to you. So underneath the physical boundaries is also sexual boundaries, which is what is okay for you sexually. Um, Do you have unsafe sex? If you don't, then that's a boundary that you need to put in place. Um, And a boundary violation there is someone touching you in any way without your permission, massaging your shoulders. Even if someone thinks you should be um, flattered by the attention, it's for you to decide whether that's okay or not. And then we have material boundaries and that's how you relate to your things. So you may, you know, lend your car to people. You may not, you may lend money to people. You may not, you may like your car to be very clean. And if your cousin comes in your car and leaves a bunch of crap around, that is a material boundary violation. And there's nothing wrong with you wanting your car to be clean. Right. And it's okay to say to your cousin, Hey man, when you leave, take your shit with you. Like you messed up my clean car. I don't like that. You know how I feel about my car. So this and so is where- many of us, sorry, in those situations, just yeah. by our tongue and like, okay, make the mess. Like you dread it. You know, it's about to happen. You bite yeah. your tongue when it's happening. They leave. And then you like swear under your breath as you're cleaning it up. Yep, exactly. We, what we do is we just put it in that file cabinet, right? You know, the file cabinet of resentment. Just another reason why cousin Bob is an asshole. There you go. Just putting it in the file cabinet. And maybe one day I'll use it. (laughs) But we don't forget those violations. And when you can just say it, it's so liberating because you're not accumulating so much resentment, right? Because when you can't say it, you are accumulating resentment. Then we have emotional boundaries, which is Knowing what, like how you feel and knowing that how other people feel is their responsibility. So when you have healthy emotional boundaries, you're not easily guilted by others. You also don't blame others for your life, your choices, and what you've done. Yeah. Can you give us an example there? Because I think we, um, we do that without realizing Well, I think that anything that we're upset about, like we we will say this person like made me feel a particular way. And the truth is people don't really make us feel. We feel what we feel based on such an array of different factors. Now, it doesn't mean maybe they did use a harsh tone with you, but instead of blaming, it's more about stepping forward and saying, hey, I'd like to make a simple request that you back up with that tone. I feel like it's really aggressive and it's really hard for me to hear what you're saying when you're talking in that way. So if you want to take a time out, I'm happy to do that. But we say something instead of being like, how I feel is that person's responsibility. We tell them, we negotiate for our needs, which is to not allow someone to talk to us in a tone that makes us feel degraded or whatever that scenario might've been, right? So that is emotional boundaries. And then you have mental boundaries, which is what you think and your opinion on things. And if you have healthy emotional boundaries, you can hold on to what you think, even if you're with others who don't think like you, who think different than you. You also don't take it super personally if they don't think like you. So those are the categories. And then, as I said before, then we look at how does the dysfunction show up? Is it porous boundaries, which means that they're too loose? So in the boundary archetype stuff, that's more like a peacekeeper or a pushover or a chameleon, right? Someone who suddenly sort of just takes on the thoughts and feelings of the people they're around. Um, 
So that's too loose. The healthy boundaries, of course, are right in the middle. And then over here are boundaries that are too rigid, where it's like in some ways an overreaction. It is the person who's like, hey, man, my way or the highway. That is a disordered boundary because it's too rigid, right? You can't work with other people if that is what you say. If you have rigid boundaries, you're way more likely to cut someone out of your life than you are to tell them what they did that hurt your feelings. You're just like, I'm done with you. Because you don't have the capacity really probably emotionally to work it out. But it's mm. this very, um, it's a reactive way of being. So there we go. Those are the categories. And then those are the types. That's amazing. I literally was about to ask you, what's the difference between a rigid boundary and a non-negotiable boundary? That's a perfect question. So let's look at what is the difference. If you are throwing down a rigid boundary, you are not really having a conversation. You, you have decided that this person did something you don't like. And you're like, it's like, here's the extreme of what it is. Mm. If a, a non-negotiable means that there's something that you cannot abide by in your life, that it is a deal breaker, mm -hmm. right? It threatens the relationship you're in. When I was dating, before I've been with my husband 25 years, but when I was dating back in the day, when I was a talent agent, one of my friends was um, setting me up with people. And I said, this is way long before there was like Tinder or any of that. And <laughs> yeah. I said, hey. I remember the days, girl, don't worry. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> I said, hey, I, and I also don't want to date anyone in recovery. Now, not because I'm judgy, because I was in recovery. And I was like, hey, one addict in a relationship is enough for me. That's my choice. And she was all like, I don't understand. That's so judgmental. Why would you do that? I was like, hey, man, you don't have to understand. See, that's my deal breaker. That's my choice. And you don't have to understand. And this is true about your boundaries, too. So people may say, you shouldn't feel that way. That is an emotional boundary violation, right? Mm -hmm. That is someone trampling on your boundaries. So you have every right to have deal breakers. And then we have an obligation to share what they are. Because if we keep our deal breakers to ourselves and our relationships, then how is the other person going to know what the problem is or what we're, what we're talking about? Um, but we also need to tell the person the other person, what is non-negotiable? Mm -hmm. And sometimes that means relationships end, right? Sometimes yeah. that's what that means. But at least you're not abandoning yourself in that process. Because in relationships where we are readily abandoning ourselves, we will eventually either leave the relationship or just be miserable. Yeah. God, that's so true. Because um, when I first met my husband, I just told him my non-negotiables and I told him like, I wasn't great at setting boundaries. It wasn't, it wasn't like I had this confidence. It was more, oh, if I don't tell him and he does it, like, because it's non-negotiable for me, my relationship's over. Yeah. So set this, set the relationship up for success and lay out the things that are important to you. And so for me, it was, if he ever cheated on me, I would literally be out the door. He wouldn't even have time to explain to me what happened. I would pack my bags and I would be out. And the same if he ever laid a finger on me abusively. Mm -hmm. I, there would just be no explanation. Those are my right. two. And I just laid them out from the beginning in order for us to both know um, how, we, how we can make this relationship succeed. But sometimes it really is hard to set to the negotiables, especially if it's like family members. Like when it's a partner, you're going to break up with them. But it's a whole different world if you set non-negotiables for parents. And I have a lot of my audience ask me a lot about how to set those boundaries with parents when, in fact, let's answer that first. And then what yep. if someone then becomes a, a regular offender of that? Well, there has to be a consequence if someone is a regular offender, right? So in the book, I teach you about a proactive boundary success plan. Mm. So these are steps that we take before we have a boundary conversation, especially if we're talking about our parents or siblings or, you know, people who you've had long relationships with. Mm. So you know them. You know, if your father is super crabby before he has his coffee in the morning, then you're probably not going to have this conversation at 7 a.m. Like you want to set yourself up to be successful. Mm -hmm. And then you come up with what is what are going to be the words that you're going to say. And in the book, I give you 
probably, I don't even know, a million <laughs> boundary scripts for every scenario from like leaving a cult to, I mean, literally I hit them all. So <laughs> you can look in there, you can definitely find something you can use. And a lot of it are just sentence starters because that's what we need. We need like, how do I approach it? You can start with gratitude, right? You can start by saying, you know how much I love you. And that's why I need to make a simple request that you, when you want to come over to my house, even though we're close, that you text me and ask me if it's convenient. Because when you use the key, A, it startles me, but B, I'm, dad, you don't know, I could be running around naked. So can we agree that if you're gonna come over during the day, you will A, ask me if it works, and B, not use your key. Now, so what do you do if, and this is a real, this is a real situation with one of my clients, that she moved close to home and the parents, even though she said, please stop coming over without warning, they were like, oh, come on, it's fine, it's just us. They kept doing it. And then she told them, hey, if you keep doing this, I will change the locks. And they were like, oh, that's ridiculous, she's not gonna change the locks. She changed the locks. And they were not, they, they weren't mad mad because she had warned them and they had been violating her boundary. But from that point forward, she said, you know, you guys, you could have just respected what I asked of you. And instead I had to, you know, spend 400 bucks to change all my locks. And now I really need for you to do this. And they actually did. But sometimes it takes a consequence, right? That consequence was them not, be, you know, jamming it in and having it not work and being like, wow, she's really serious about this. And she was. So I think that it depends on what boundary violations are happening. It depends on if the family system is toxic or not. These are two really important parts, because if you're talking about having a narcissistic mother, or anything that I've talked about, about the normal and healthy way of setting boundaries does not apply. If you're talking so what about- what would you do in that situation then if you do have a narcissistic parent? Oh, step back. Yeah. Step back. You know, there are a lot of psychotherapists who- will we'll say, you know, you can change that relationship, but I've seen the damage that allowing a narcissist to be close to you, especially when you're, you're a woman and it's your mother, it's, oh my God, it is just devastating. So it depends. Do they have narcissistic tendencies or are they a full-blown mm. toxic narcissist. And again, those are two extremes because if someone just has narcissistic tendencies and they're not really diagnosable, they could change, but you have to say, Hey, you know, whatever, I'd like to make a simple request. That's one way of putting it. Or I wanted to bring it, you know, get it on your radar. Um, I wanted to talk to you about what happened last Wednesday, how, how I wanted to let you know how I felt. And again, when we are communicating, we're always sticking to our side of the street. We are so clear that we are not using you. We are not pointing fingers. We are not making sweeping generalizations. When you talk about yourself, this was my experience. Who can say, no, it wasn't. I mean, somebody might try, but generally speaking, when someone says, hey, this is what happened for me. I'm not saying that was your intention, but I want you to know that you being late really made me feel unimportant. So I just want you to know that because I love you and I don't want it to keep happening, right? We're telling people how we feel. So we're not adding stuff to that file cabinet. God, I love that so much. And giving people words to start the conversation, like it's so powerful to me because I can't get out of my own way of how my thoughts are spinning in my head. I just can't. And so I go, okay, I'm not going to let that stop me. So what are the th things I can do? What tools can I use in order to still set the boundaries? Because I know long-term it's good for me. And so having things like that, the phrases that allow me to start the conversation is so powerful. Um, one of the things that I started to do was saying to people that I love I'm really struggling with and this is how you can help because again I used to come in that like you're doing this wrong and like anything it's just like when you're telling someone that they're doing something wrong what are they going to do immediately defend themselves right. and so I had to change the strategy and find words that would help um, and so that thing that you just said was so beautiful in giving people that opening sentence to be able to you know start the discussion. And, and another thing, Lise, is that we never want to say to someone, 
we need to talk. Because you know what? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody ever wants to talk to you. When you are, I just, I just scared myself. If anyone says we need to talk, you're like, oh my God, no way. So. You come in with those defenses already up, correct? (laughs) Of course. You've warned them. You've told them to put their defenses up. So we love to do it in a neutral way. Part of the, the proactive boundary success plan is visualizing it going well. And when I say going well, I don't mean controlling what they do. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about you being the baller that you are, having the courage to negotiate for what you want and telling the truth, because that is where your healing is. Your healing is insane. What I think matters, how I feel matters, because I matter. And if other people go, oh, you're, I don't like your new boundaries, or I don't like what you're doing, we learn a lot about people when we start to put boundaries in place. And you will find that some people are very flexible and appreciative for the intel about you. And then some people are all offended and you, you know, you, you will have data to make some decisions in your life, but nothing can be more important than your relationship with yourself. And that healing by standing up is just so profound. I love that. And you actually said um, a little earlier about staying in your lane. Um, Can you talk to me more about that? Because I believe you give a story in the book where it's like us overstepping other people's boundaries. Because that's also important, right? If we want people to respect our boundaries and really um, embrace them, we need to be giving the gift that we want. And so you talk about staying in our lane. Can you talk to me a bit about that? I'm laughing a little bit because it is so classic that all the overgivers, right? And when I was an overgiver, Anyone who had boundaries and wasn't doing what I was doing, just like laying themselves out for anyone, I would be like, oh, she is so entitled. She is such a bitch. Like, I cannot believe she said no after everything I've done for her. I mean, that she didn't ask me to do, but I'm still holding it against her. So it's a great point that you bring up of how do we keep our side of the street clean, which means we don't just learn how to say no we learn how to accept someone else's no and talk about that and try to have healthy emotional boundaries and not take it all so personally if they don't do what we want them to do. So, and this is also a process. And you can say, hey, I'm struggling. As you said, I'm, I'm struggling right now with that, but I respect your right to choose. Mm-hmm. And if we want others to respect our right, to our boundaries, we have to also, you know, you give as good as you get. We have to also be able to do that for others. And I feel like, especially as you're, you're moving away from codependency, Mm. it is really hard because codependents are, you know, we're like giving advice, auto advice, giving all around town. And then we're like mad when someone doesn't take the advice that we didn't, they didn't even ask us for like, well, if Betty had just done what I said to do, she wouldn't be in this mess. (laughs) just tend your own life codependent. So we we learn to move away from that, Mm -hmm. but being able to accept and not center all of these things on ourselves is very humbling. Yeah. And especially when it's someone that we love, we always trying to fix them, but Mm -hmm. sometimes in that fixing, it makes them feel badly about themselves. Of course, of course it does. I remember a situation with my husband years ago where his rep at the time embezzled money from, it was like a whole thing. And I was ridiculously over the top. I was calling lawyers. I was going to get an entertainment lawyer. I was so, 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 so mad. And I could see that the more hysterical I became about revenge and getting it from her and whatever I was doing, he was becoming more and more almost like distraught. And then I finally said to him, Hey babe, how can I best support you right now. Cause I, I really got like what I was doing was not it. And he said, you can trust that I will handle this. And I probably won't handle it how you, you fiery airy, how you would handle it. Right. But at trust that I'm going to get it done the way I need to get it done. And I was like, you got it. I stepped off that situation and he handled the entire thing. But that's a perfect example of you saying we're making the other people feel incompetent Mm -hmm. by being like, I have a better idea. You should do it this way. That isn't how I would do it. Well, who the frig asked you? It's not your life. (laughs) 
stay on your own side of the street (laughs) and support the people that you love in finding their own answers, because that really is love. And it doesn't mean if your friend says, hey, I really would like your opinion. It doesn't mean we never give our friends our opinion or our partners, but that's specific. That's specific language. Vic, my husband will say to me now, okay, so are you venting or am, are we brainstorming? Like what, what, what would, you know, right, how, yeah, yeah. how can I best support <laughs> you right now? And I'll be like, I'm just venting. He's like, okay, good to know. Go. <laughs> like, so he knows he's not going to be saying anything because I'm venting. And those nuances of preferences, because that's what they are, that we share with the people we love deepens our intimacy, our intimacy in such a profound way. I love that. I do that with my husband too, because I would go into, I just need to be heard. And he would go into, I need to fix it for you. And so we would just end up butting heads. And it's like, hang on a minute. We both are trying to, you know, he's trying to be sweet and kind, um, but I'm not perceiving it like that because it's not the, the, the communication that I'm looking for right now in this moment. Yep. Um, I've heard you say, which is so fascinating, about um, indecisions. And I never thought of it like this, but I actually have a great quote of yours. Crippling indecision keeps us stuck in terrible situations long past the expiration date. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that? Because I never even thought twice about indecisions. Well, indecision, I've seen this in my therapy practice over and over and over. When someone comes in and says, you know, I just can't decide what to do in my relationship. I'm so torn. I'm like, you're not torn. You don't want to know what you already know because you don't think you have the skills to extricate yourself. It's so scary that it's, it's almost like your mind will play a trick on you and be like, well, here's the pros and here's the cons. Another thing about staying in indecision is that it's a way to A, not make decisions. So you don't have to deal with the fallout of making decisions, right? Because you're staying in the in-between, the holding pattern of not yes, not no. But there's something about that, that life makes the decisions for you, right? So if you stay in a decision and you don't decide, you are deciding. So that person who would say to me, I'm torn about the relationship, in her not making the decision to leave, that tornness was basically a decision to stay. So I always say, look at the secondary gain, right? Which is the unobvious gain you get by staying stuck. So how do we know what that is? What, what, what are you gaining, right? So with that client, I could say, what is, she, what is she gaining out of being in indecision in her relationship? And the question you ask to decipher that is, what do I get to not face, not feel, or not experience by staying stuck here. So in her case, when she could finally answer the questions, I get to not face the state of my relationship. I get to not feel terrified of having a conversation I don't know how to have, right? I get to avoid that. But then we look at, but what do you lose? What do you lose? Right. And, you know, of course, then we got to what do you lose is you lose the option of finding healthy love that you really want to be in, having a relationship with yourself that isn't all about codependency. So there's a lot of things, but I feel like that secondary gain, that one question um, is so powerful. No matter where you are stuck in your life, if you can reveal the unobvious gain you're getting unconsciously by staying stuck, it makes it so much easier to get unstuck terry terry your book is so freaking amazing everything we've spoken about today has been so powerful i love bringing new thoughts new ideas new growth into my own life and so how you've broken down boundaries and really identified the trouble that we get ourselves into so beautiful where can people find you and buy your amazing book you can go to well terrycole.com you can also get the book at boundarybossbook.com. I have a ton of uh, bonuses that I'm still giving out for people. Um, if you want to take the boundary quiz, just go to boundaryquiz.com and get your archetype. And I guarantee you, Lisa, I already know yours. I'm not going to say it. You're going to take it and you're going to tell oh, me. Who so cares? Okay, that's a deal. <laughs> We're going to do that. On Instagram, I'm just Terry Cole. And I have the Terry Cole show, which is a podcast I've had for the last almost seven years. Amazing. 
saying, guys, guys, you've got to go check out this book. When I said I couldn't put it down, there were so many nuggets of gold. So go buy the book. Check out this woman. She's doing fire work. Set boundaries in your life. Have the life you want. Don't allow people to push you around. Take ownership. And until next time, be the hero of your own life. Peace out, guys.